All right, welcome back from Matthew chapter seven. If you see me wearing the same outfit, that's because <laughs> I'm recording a couple videos in a row. I've got a very busy week coming up, so I needed to uh, kind of plan ahead. Um, it's not that I don't wash my clothes. All right, uh, ch Matthew chapter seven, verse one. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judged, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. All right, so this is one of the most abused and misquoted verses of scripture in the entire Bible. The common default is that a Christian should never judge anybody. However, there are numerous passages all over scripture where a believer is instructed to exercise wise discernment about a person's character and at times are even told to avoid certain people for our own protection, both physically and spiritually. Uh, there's a situation even in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where we're told to not even eat with the so-called believer who ignores and shuns church discipline as an attempt to get them to reflect on their situation and repent. John chapter 7 verse 24 says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So then the question is, what in the world is going on here, and is a Christian ever to make a judgment upon somebody else? Well, if we look a little closer at it, it spells it out for us. It's clearly saying that if you yourself aren't in good standing with God, how can you then in turn point out somebody else who isn't either? Uh, do you think that they're going to listen to you knowing the dirty laundry that you're keeping in your closet yourself? But then, in verse 5, it says to go take care of your own issue before God, and then you will be able to help somebody else see theirs. Or in other words, don't be a hypocrite. That's the whole point. Uh, there is such a thing as judging somebody righteously, and that is done in love and with good motive to try to help them see the error of their ways, and ultimately, uh, you just want them to be in a right relationship with God, uh, not to talk down upon them. For this to happen, that person has to know you as an upright person to begin with who walks the straight and narrow. Only then will they likely even consider giving you the time of day to hear what you think. God won't work his wonders when uh, the sin shield is blocking the way. He's got all the time he desires to wait for us to comply. Verse 6. Do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Believers, let us please remember this every day. Um, the message of the scriptures are precious, eternal, life-giving truths. If we encounter somebody who hates the message of what Jesus did on behalf of sin, continuing to try to reason with them is like negotiating with terrorists or digging deeper on top of a manure pile. John chapter three tells us that men love darkness. They flat out enjoy their sin and don't want somebody telling them what is wrong with them. Uh, without a miraculous working of the Holy Spirit to soften their heart, they've got no chance. The best thing to do is to walk away and go to God about it in private and pray earnestly for their repentance and salvation, that God would do a miraculous work on their hardened heart. Uh, that's really all we can do in some situations. And uh, don't walk away in doubt because God's a God of miracles and has been in the business of saving hopeless causes for centuries, including myself. Verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If someone genuinely wants to know God, uh, he's available at all hours of the day. The open sign is always lit. Verse 9. Or what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? Verse 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Or in other words, if you tainted ragamuffins on earth can even do some things right now and then, you don't think God can't put your good deeds to shame? Verse 12, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Um, that's it right there, folks, plain and simple. Being loving and kind to others was the whole point of what the prophets were trying to get at and what the law intended to do. 
Verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Um, do you guys think I need to repeat that? I think I do. Let's go over that again. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who will enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who will find it. Very sobering passage in scripture. Verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Yep, fancy suits, traditional garb, smiling faces, supernatural visitations with no witnesses, made up traditions, and messages completely contrary or contorted to the pages found in the Bible can be easily found in this world. Avoid these frauds like the plague. And it tells us here that we'll know them by the character of the person or the group. All right, verse 18. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, that's who will enter. All right, so this is, uh, again, very, very eye-opening and something we need to be thinking about. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. All right, we've talked about this before. God isn't the only one involved in this current worldly system who can make supernatural things happen. Since Genesis, the old serpent has been using his angelic abilities to lure people into supernatural deceptions. I personally think UFOs, lights and sounds in the sky, Bigfoot, and paranormal sightings today are just another part of his shady scheme to defer people's attention from Christ. Do I think people really see that stuff? Without a doubt, absolutely. Uh, but I don't think what they're seeing is what they think that they're seeing. Um, in the days of the Old Testament and Christ, Satan would do as many supernatural stunts as he was able to muster in order to mimic the, uh, the, the miracle master. But he was limited in his abilities. Yet he had plenty of tricks up his sleeve to fool a crowd. And in verses 22 and 23 here, we see that his followers had zero ability in getting God to think they were something other than what they really were, followers of the devil. Uh, verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So uh, what words is he talking about here? Well, this chapter has told us not to be hypocrites, to refrain from arguing with the opponents of Christ, to seek after God, to trust the Lord for provision and blessing, to treat others the way that we want to be treated, to not follow the crowd, but to walk the narrow road, to watch out for posers, and finally, to avoid lawlessness. The one who does these things is rock in the house. I mean, he uh, has his house on the rock. All right, verse 25. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Sorry, Dwayne Johnson, but uh, Jesus is the rock. Verse 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Um, so the message to us is don't wait, approach God today, confess your sins and acknowledge his suffering on the cross on your behalf. The majority of people are on a path to destruction don't be like them. He can spot out a phony a light year away. So let's not play any games. There's no time for that. The time is now to repent and believe. Uh, please take this message seriously. Okay, God bless you. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I hope you be here. Take care.